going on, my friends? I'm Rick, and this is your seat at the table, and we are looking at a crowded desk. And what it is, right? This is the War of 3039, Battletech Historical Fact, whatever. So this is produced by FanPro, Wiz, uh, WizKids Games or whatever. And um, this came out during an era where I wasn't involved in Battletech, where I had kind of been tuned out for quite a while. And I've kind of, and now there's things like this that made me wish I hadn't, that I had stuck into it as best I could. There, there was so much. I got really, really fortunate to actually get this off the internet, and I didn't pay more than, much more than what the value of the book would have been when you bought it from the producers. And it looks utterly new. I mean, it's, I've read through it twice now, uh, and I've been gleam, gleaning through it a bit more than that. So so uh, it's in my pile of stuff over here that I intend to do videos on. And I thought, well, you know, let's just grab this and get it done. Uh, let me see what we got through here. So we got our credits explaining the heart of the fall, how things, as I look at the inner uh, so it says, how things came to pass, the rise of Te uh, Teddy Corita, the War 3039, basic personalities, the various waves that take place, the aftermath, rules annexation. So how things came to pass, the rise of Teddy, Teddy Corita or Theodore Corita, and a tenant's fever. You know, Theodore was unprepared to take unilateral action on the uh, Razzlehog issue, but when Harkona Magnuson ordered declared himself first prince of the Free Razzlehog Republic on March 30, 34, the Korean signed off on the agreement that not only created a buffer state between the Combine and the Combo, but also we know it led to the the Ronin Wars and a bunch of other not so uh, conducive. But it did do a great job of, of putting in some much needed space between him and a and a significant portion of the Federated Commonwealth. That meant the FedCom would have to either come through the uh, Free Republic or uh, Razzleha or Free Razzleha Republic to get to them through three quarters of the boundary uh, uh, border, and uh, which would give the House time to react to it. Uh, it also meant one less problematic region of space that that the House created had to deal with. And it really set off a lot of hard uh, hardcore uh, conservative types in the, the Combine. They were not happy with it, which led to the Ronin Wars, which if they did a source book on that, I'm not, I don't know that they did or they didn't. I don't own one. I would be interested to find one if they did. Uh, if anybody knows about it, that would be great. Anyway, uh, the War 3039, this, this was basically uh, Hans Davion's second show his 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 he had cowed and 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 nearly destroyed the compelling confederation reduced it to a point where it was not really a material threat to him on a on the grand scheme of things uh, from the skullduggery and under the table the dagger in the back stuff he had no faction as to you know, no how small they are are uh are not consider some kind of threat. But from a military perspective, he enforced his idea of a dynasty uh, for his family and the family of the Federated Commonwealth going forward, uh, reduced the effectiveness of the Compelling Confederation. The Free Worlds League has been in turmoil, a turmoil, a tor a tor a turmoil for most of its existence, and as long as they didn't actively go after the Free Worlds, giving them a reason to unite, uh, Hans Devion didn't really have any real worries about uh, uh, the Merricks or anybody over there getting froggy in any significant manner. This left the only true real foe in their in Hans Deviant's eyes and a traditional foe of the Federated Sons as much if not more so than the Compelling Confederation is House Creta and the Draconis Combine. So this was the his attempt to break the Combine to not completely destroy it because I don't think he the FedCom had that kind of resources. But his idea would be to neuter it, to reduce its effectiveness to be a major threat to uh, his his uh, progeny and generations there to come. And that's in part that drive to not so much become the first Lord of the Star League because that's not on the table. That's not really it. He just Hans Davion wanted to make sure the Federated Commonwealth and his family were top dogs, and the biggest threat to them at this point was the Draconis Combine, which in reality, as long as Theodore Corita was calling the shots, wasn't likely to happen. It's not that the, 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 it would have been impossible for the House uh, Corita to actually go after the FedCom, but it would be stupid, and 
theater was anything but stupid. It also had no reason to do it. So in reality, uh, they did nothing to incite this attack from Hans Davion and his cronies. So I'm just saying it was a strict power play from uh, the Fed, Fedcom side of things. And uh, so they, they earned what they got, as far as I'm concerned. Keeping in mind, too, traditionally, the Draconis Combine is a potent foe. They are probably more effective on the offensive than they are on the defensive. And they're dedicated, they're, they're almost fanatical in many, many aspects to think that they're just going to be a rollover with foolhardy at best. History over and over and over again proves that to be false. And as we know in uh, the modern 2150, 2180 age, that that is still false because it's the Federated Suns that are reeling from a major stress to their center. And I'm sure without a doubt that the Suns will recover and House Davion will reclaim uh, the, the uh, new Avalon. But this isn't the second time in the history of the Inner Sphere that the Draconis Combine has penetrated significant gains into the deep into the Federated Suns. And the uh, first time they've captured the capital, but not the first time they came close to it. And the fact is that they can do that and then do it again several centuries later. You just gotta you gotta respect them a bit more than what uh, than I think they were respected at the point of thirty thirty nine. So we get the preparations that they were making, uh, general personalities across the board, and great this is great source book material, great material for for lore and for history because it explains things. Then of course traditionally we follow Hans Davion's methodology. If you followed him in the first the fourth succession war, then you understand that's basically what he's he's using a, he's already using the same the same war book twice. He's established that this is a good way to do it. We're gonna do it this way. And so he does the same thing. And what he does what he's that helps prepare his foes to understand and I have a really good idea how this is going to play out and how to counter it. Another thing that we don't have uh, understand or have to understand is is that uh, the at this point Comstar under uh, Minutu uh, Waterly has become much more aggressive, much more uh, uh, above board in their actions. They're, she's, she's determined to push the uh, the Blake agenda, the Comstar agenda forward at a better at a better pace. And in the process of doing so, they want the inner sphere houses to be at war. They don't want the Federated Commonwealth to exist. They want to see things fracture and be more factions because the weaker they are, the better chances the Comstar has of gaining control over them above or below the board. So in at line the thought, Comstar aids the House Korea by providing mechs, technology, intelligence, support of number uh, in a number of ways, a number of avenues. It's that support that in, it, in part, and the creative thinking outside the box that Theodore is is becomes famous for doing allows him to basically enhance the DCMS on on a grand scale that was unprecedented up to this point and you tapping sources of, of, of men and material that none of his predecessors would have done because of uh, honor or because of some misguided idea or this this case, this internal case system that basically runs everything I mean it is what it is but uh, at the end of the day this is in part what we're dealing with and uh, it plays its role, in my opinion. So this is where he gets the, the Ghost Legions. The Ghost Legions, a lot of the equipment comes from Comstar, and the warriors, the, to outfit them, come from the Yakuza and elements within the, the lesser case of society in exchange for some, you know, quid pro quo kind of stuff going down the road. And, and it, it also allows for these uh, people who are just as stoutly uh, Cretan at heart, stoutly uh, uh, defenders uh, or believers in the Draconis Combine system and style to 
actively gain a little bit more respect or at least participate. So in addition, they also have assets and mechs and equipment that they're able to bring to the Ghost Legions. And these jacing basically adds to this shock factor once, once the uh, AFFC comes forward and, and, and engages in this combat that they come to the, a misguided conclusion that uh, the the DCMS is weaker than it actually is, and that it enables them to uh, put reverse the tables. And on a side note, this this in part is kind of uh, impertinent to, or important too, because I'm currently process one of the the things I'm doing for my channel is I'm creating a uh, what if segment. So what if the clans did not invade? What would happen, potentially would happen in 4049 instead of the clan invasion? And my view or my take on that would be the obvious second go around. The War 3039 is an utter failure in many ways. Uh, and it's an eye opener and, a, and an education to Hans Davion, but more importantly to his, his general his, his general staff. And a lot of things that they took for granted, they're going to typically learn from and, and to avoid in the second go around. And 10 years will have passed since 3039, which gave them sufficient amount of time to recoup their losses, train, better plan more thoroughly and to prepare for doing things in a different manner and to work it with a new playbook or a new war book take a different task at a different angle at taking a stab a second stab at taking down or eliminating uh, the Taconis combine as a threat and so it's taking me a little bit longer to do than I planned because I'm, I'm I, I want to do as good a job as I can and I'm writing it from the perspective as what I think would have happened and uh, it's taking there's more it's more involved than what one would might think or in my mind it's justifiable it may actually need to be done in two parts because I don't really want an hour-long video for this material because I know that the attention span of most people is less than 10 minutes when we move on I'm a guilty of that too that's the reason why most of my videos I, I the playtime is only in minutes and I'm fine with that I always, like I've said before, I like the material, I like talking about it, I like sharing, I like giving, I'm a very opinionated person, obviously, and a bit bombastic, and I acknowledge this, and I want to share and do and, and contribute to that. So going back to 3039, uh, we get the various waves, how successful the initial waves are, so on and so forth, then we get into the second wave, and things start to come apart a little bit, things start to slow down, uh, the momentum is still going on, uh, but the high command has not quite caught on. Maybe not everything is quite as smoothly transitioning as they expected it to. That maybe just maybe there's more going on behind the scenes in Draconis Combine than what they should. In addition to that, the com or the Fed comms, uh, Hans Davion and and his people are having some backlashes at home because there's a, there's a up, upstanding. You know the Sky March issue uh, is is becoming more heated. Uh, there's agitation on on uh, several fronts in the Fed Suns component uh, uh, for more action, and it just gets a bit more distracting. Also, I think Hans is beginning to start to have some doubts or worry. He's not one to go on and belabor that stuff, but it's possible. Anyway, so we got other Wave 1 actions. So the first 20 pages is just dealing with Wave 1. Shows you how many big things are going on. So we got Valerian operations, DCM off operations. Obviously, the DCM is also not sitting idle. They are trying to strike back. They are trying to consolidate. And then we also have Healing the Rift, the War 30... 39, so Wolf Dragoons were turning to their first active service since the Fourth Succession War. They're the wiped out in this conflict. Despite a decade of rebellion, Dragoons are still far from full strength by the time Prince Davion was ready to invade the Draconis Combine. Four Dragoons regiments, blah, blah, blah. So we see the Dragoons reappear and attack the, the CMS uh, in conjunction with the Federated Commonwealth or an employee thereof. I got Free Worlds, uh, Free Worlds League Operations. 
3039 began. Free Worlds was in the final stage of its own civil war to bring a successionist Andrian back into the realm. So there's plenty of things to keep them busy. And you can bet you that the FedCom uh, mil uh, intelligence min uh, ministry had also kept poking away and trying to keep that that way. Then, which brings us to the Shadow War. So the Irregular War, the ISF War. That's just something that uh, if you consider battle and war to be the the epitaph or the 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 the, the accumulation of all the things that, that everything is supposed to be heading towards uh, your your intelligence ministry your intelligence services the candlestein actions of these these resources play a massive role but they also play a bigger role than what people want to assume I, i'm a big fan of the dagger versus the sword the dagger is much more uh selective it's uh, can also be just as destructive as the sword applied in the right way and so the fact that you are you would be a fool to discount the Draconis's combines uh, int uh, intelligence ministry's capabilities because the isf has a has a, a dark and, and a very brutal uh, reputation that's well earned, but they're also ruthlessly efficient reputation that they are also uh, well earned. They are easily equal to uh, or uh, surpassing in many areas to anything that the FedCom uh, intelligence capabilities are. And to discount them in any other way is less than foolhardy. It's just downright stupid. I mean, they are not safe by 10 miles. You know, put a 10 kilometer distance with them in a, pole, a 10 foot pole to boot. So we got the lick in the Milo War. And then that brings us to other back to internal conflicts. And one of the, the 10 years is still not a sufficient amount enough time for that, that, uh, that melding of the Laren Commonwealth forces and intelligence services with the Federated Sons because the Federated Sons comes in and they get some hubris, they got arrogance on their part because they believe, even if they don't openly admit that they believe, that they're superior to their Laren Commonwealth commerce. They, they, in some aspects, they forget, and, and we see this somewhat in the nobility too, they forget that they're equal citizens, equal participants in this grand thing called the Federated Commonwealth, and it's not. The Fed sums are dominating the the Lyrans because it's uh, not the way it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, there is some of that going on, and then there's this res this resistance from the Lyran half of things to just give in and and become joined and and make one entity. Because in reality, that one entity is always going to be the Fed, wants to be the Fed comms being on top of the on top of everything. And there's there's good good reasons for them to not be okay with it. So there's a conflict in between the two major intelligence branches of the Federate Comm. Well, at a time when they should not, they do not need this distraction. I mean, you really do not need this distraction. This sort of thing needs to be hammered out and straightened out before then. And secret whispers, black, talk, uh, black box technologies, uh, communications, you know, wave two and the counterattacks. So finally, we start to see the DCMS were get, uh, responding. Uh, they, they say that the DCM was caught off guard. Well, they were caught off guard, but not as badly as the FedCom expected them to be and hoped for them to be, in part because uh, they had friends in Comstar that, that gave their leadership some uh, heads up that there's something going south. So this allows House uh, Theodore to start planning a return and some of the best defenses and offense. And the House Creed is, that's an established from their playbook. Something the FedComs should have known that Hans Devion and all his so-called brilliance apparently dropped the ball there. They didn't expect or plan for that DCMS counterattack because, hello, the DCMS is no is notorious for this sort of thing. You attack me, uh, I'm going to come back and attack you, and I'm going to hit you from the side or from the behind, or I'm going to do you, I'm going to do you in before you do me in. And if you got to take some, you know, if you're going to take some of my stuff away from me in the process, you going to lose in the long run this is the route we're going to take and that is pure creative that is pure combine and if you fail to understand that basic and prepare and more importantly plan for it you get what you got coming you know just my personal opinion hmm. that said 
Hans Davion, as genius as he is, could very well have planned and prepared for the counteroffensives that he knew they were that the combine would do, just not in the manner and the sheer size that they were able to achieve, because he didn't have an under he didn't know that Comstar was abetting and aiding uh, the combine behind the scenes and specifically helping them with giving them the the mech resources to fill out a damn near a tw you know, twelve regiments of true of ghost legions. So I mean, you just you don't expect that big of a of a uh, hidden force coming at you. It's hard to prepare for it. But he didn't. From all I've read, it didn't appear that Hans Davion or his generals really prepared for any kind of counter contingency to a counter attack. If you have the resources, the Fed comms have the resources to do this. They could have kept some units in reserve specifically to counter these things on a, a faster than they were able to do and not strip those forces away from their, their spear point and their thrust into the combine. It's just my thought and process on it. You know? And there's also something that is said about the process of how they attack the combine as well. I think their fronts was way too broad. And they did a bad job of not hitting the combine from both sides when they should have. That's just my personal opinion on it. And uh, instead of focusing on such a wide front, they should have focused on a deeper thrust, ideally straight for the capital, and to put the combine definitely on the defensive. There's something that the clans did do. The clans were driving for Terra, and Luthien just happened to be in the path. And they weren't going to stay. They were built determined uh, hell or high water to gain Terra even though they were stopped. So anyway, we go on to that and various locations of battles and things for the wave two and get into that? there's a couple profiles here. Playing for the highest stakes, other actions, change of command. Galter, mercenary supported actions, the last battle, the Aberdeen, the Gladian Thrust. We're going through here. Duty honor, price too high. DCMS counter invasion. Hundreds of senior officials from the AFFS and the LCAF spent more than a year formulating battle plans for the invasion of the Draconis Combine. They planned for the worst as well for the best. In fact, two teams of planners spent all their time trying to think of every eventuality. Not surprising, those teams prepared contingency plans that dealt with a concentrated DCMS counterattack, including the appearance of never-before-seen line regiments and assaults deep in the Federated Suns and the Lyran Commonwealth. No one, however, expected the Combine to have constructed so many as 20 new battle mech regiments, including the 12 so-called ghost regiments, and to the counterattack of such overwhelming force. See, they didn't take the, the worst case scenario. Well, let's plan for this, and let's plan for that, but that's just, you know, somebody didn't go up and say, okay, but what if, what if somehow, I don't know, Kerensky's kids returned and helped the DCM, DCMS somehow? How do we, can we counter it? How do we counter it? How do we prepare to mitigate that sort of a scenario? They just didn't, they like to think they plan for everything, but they never plan for everything. Because in theory, it's hard to cover everything. I get that. But still, I think they, they did not prepare well enough for this uh, counterattack that they knew was going to come. It just wasn't, they, they could have blunted it much faster and sooner than, or even more efficiently than they did. And this was the beginning of the end for the 30-39 campaign. It's forcing the, the Fedcoms to blink. Hans Davion blinked first. So, Prince of Audacity. So, we see actual invasions into Fedcom space by DCMS forces. Other wave two actions. You know, Free World League operations. <clears throat> there wasn't a whole lot going on in the Federated Compel or the, uh, the Compellents, but they did start to wake up to opportunities, which brings us to Compellent Operations, the MAC attack. So trying to take some worlds away from the FedCom while the FedCom forces were distracted, which was probably a bad idea. So we get into the aftermath, uh, the aftershocks, and 
that's worthy of a video just under itself. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the DCMS succeeds to only defend its space, but actually to go on the offensive on a scale that was totally underestimated by the FedCom. And the fact that FedCom started to have doubts, Hans Debian started to have doubts because of this, that what else was waiting for them, what else was uh, Theodore uh, and Takashi uh, going to be able to scrounge up, and had they held their ground, had they pressed the attack, had they bit the bullet and attacked the attackers, hit the counterattack with a counterattack of their own and it did so harder, things might have went the other way. But no, they got to a point where uh, somebody lost their nerve, somebody uh, got a lot of doubt, you know, somebody in the cough, uh, cough, cough, Hans, Davion sort of thing, uh, drop the ball, and it is what it is. So we get some rules annex, of course, some additional updates and some changes, uh, how to assign the forces, assigning units to classic battle tech, oh, things like this. So all in all, I, I enjoyed this. This was a very good book, and I enjoyed reading it, and I, I expect to read it several times uh, down in the future, too, because uh, there, it really opened a window to a very crucial point in the history of the Inner Sphere, uh, especially to the lead-up to the Klan invasion in 49. We understand now in, in uh, uh, 49 why, or in 50 and 51, why uh, there was much more willingness for detente between Theodore Corita and Hans Davion, more importantly between their, child, their two sons who learned to cooperate and work together and, and developed a respect for each other, fighting a third, a much worse foe. A friend of my friend is my, a friend of my enemy is my friend kind of scenario is very apt here. But do you ever consider that the two great families that rule these two great houses would somehow become best of buds was just downright foolhardy. So the fine things were going to go south again at some point. It's not it's not unexpected. The the their their system and style and, and philosophies are so vastly different from each other. It's just never going to be great. Uh, and never going to get uh, to a point where there's not going to be conflict because that's the nature of the human beast that populates the the uh, uh, inner, the Battletech universe as we know and love it. Anyway, if you ever get a chance, chance, if you do not own this book and you can find a copy, they're still out there, I would look for one. I think it's worth buying and having just for the knowledge and filling that more detail in that gap. And uh, if you can get a PDF version of it, great. If not, it is what it is. But like I said, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to get it. I was doubly glad I was able to get it in a hardback version. Uh, I recently purchased the, uh, there was a bundle option operated by something bundle. Uh, somebody on uh, or, uh, on uh, Red's podcast, Red mentioned it, and I went and checked it out, and there was a whole slew of, of stuff. PDFs that were available for 30 bucks, and I thought, you know, I got to do this. Uh, I really, there's so much material there, including when there was the Ill Clan, the Ill Clan source book in PDF uh, format. Uh, I went to look, try to buy a hard cap copy version of it, and they're much more expensive. And, and it's just, I just chose, and then uh, I chose not to. And much as I don't like PDFs, uh, they all, they do have some functions. So I took that, and then uh, this last week I actually uh, took it to work and I printed it out um, using the, uh, you know, the company Xerox. And don't, don't tell anybody at work. And uh, so now I just need to get a folder, a binder, and, and a bunch of sleeves and stick them all in a binder so I got a physical version of it. It's the idea of being able to take it with me. I, I want to read through it. There's these so these source books are so important. Uh, the the novels are awesome. You get great great stuff and great things from reading these novels and stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, the novels don't need uh, you don't get uh, the uh, details as much on a wider front a wider view of what's going on in an era or in a sub era so having those source books come out because right now I'm looking at Tamar Rising over here things I still got in my stack that I have yet to do videos on and it's because I got so many other things and other projects I want to do. Uh, I want to go back in and I want to do some more uh, in the various intelligence services of the inner sphere. You know, we've got uh, you know, periphery field manual uh, that I've yet to do. I got a, a first first succession war, which is coming up that I would like to do a video on. You know, Tamer Mac uh, sitting here. There's about five more sitting over there. I got two more uh, sitting 
in the bathroom where I read sometimes and those are on my would-be list of things to do so it's all great and fine and dandy I'm coming to end of my video time for today though I try not to spend more than a couple hours I only get one day a week for this sort of thing it's part partial of being married uh, with a wife who doesn't game and I'm grateful for the time I get to spend on these videos and uh, once again, I try to make them, I try to have a little bit of an extra surplus. I've been lucky lately. I've been able to put out a video every day or two. I'm trying to shoot for every two days. And I know that some videos are more interesting than others. And I know some videos are more into your guys' line of things. It's, some of them have some absolutely nothing to do with Battletech. Uh, some of it's just filler. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm doing this stuff for my own game system uh, in part because I, I just I spent so many years working on it. I just kind of want to retouch base with it, and I also want to share it a little bit and try to gain some ins inspiration. Uh, procrastination is is an easy word to say. One of the you know it's hard to just sit down and spend two hours doing this and two hours doing that when you're you work the crazy hours I work. And technically, I probably wouldn't be doing videos today at all had things. This is the nature of my beast. So this is a griping phase. So if you have a problem with me griping, then uh, go ahead and tune out if you made it this far. And if you did, hey, I'm glad you stuck in with me. Uh, my, my work truck, I went in yesterday. I should have had a 14-hour day yesterday, 15 hours, which would have put me in the 50-plus cat, 50 plus category for work this week. Uh, instead, I went to work, and the air system on the truck was completely empty. And it, it, the night before, I was out on my last job. I put a 14-hour day in on Wednesday, or uh, 13 on Wednesday, 14 on uh, Thursday. And I was out about 8 o'clock Thursday night, and the truck is running and suddenly it lost air and the alarms go off lights start flashing and if you run a vehicle that depends on air to maintain your brakes you do not want that to happen that is a flag and so i uh, went into work friday morning uh, the thing re-engaged re that the air came back but it should never have done that that's a warning sign they got warning lights and buzzers for a reason so Friday morning, I went into work at 7, started the truck up, and everything's completely depressed. What I mean by that is the truck has airbags in the back. They should not have lost any air. They should have stayed inflated all night. They should not have left, lost air. The seat is pneumatic. It should not have lost air. There's too many things here. So something in the system major has gone south. So I, I should have worked six hours yesterday morning and another another. Uh, eight or nine hours over the evening and uh, went to about three or four in the morning but I told the boss and we both agreed that it was something that needed to be addressed so we took it to a mechanic uh, and gratefully they were able to get it in and get it fixed and it was uh, a component had broken loose and then rubbed, rubbed a hole in another component that has something to do with the airlines so it was fairly reasonably cheap for the truck repair and they were able to repair it fairly quickly and you know, I got the truck back last night but by the time they did I'd already rescheduled everything for next week and next week's going to be uh, for me work-wise I'm pushing 40 hours in three days so uh, because I want, an ex I want an extended weekend I want to take uh, Wednesday night through uh, Sunday off and then I'll work Sunday evening and hopefully I'll get a chance next weekend to, to do videos I'd like to do my video on uh, the uh, what if revolving about what what might have happened in the game had the plants not invaded it, my option of course there are a million possibilities there's a hundred thousand possible stories that didn't that didn't take place because they took the path that they did and uh, in a, on a caveat on that that's kind of funny because I just finished last night before I went to bed uh, I read three or four pages out of an out of a book every night and I read uh, one of the dark age novels that I uh, that had been recommended once again by Red on this channel, and the very it's kind of bland, kind of boring, uh, which is typical of the Dark Age material. Uh, I was that's one of the reasons I, I lost interest in Dark Age was when they first the first couple novels came out. I'm like, oh, what the hell is this crap? Where did this come from? So this this novel is much later in the series, but it the very ending is interesting because the last chapter or two is dealing with a what might be considered a post whatever 
So years later, after this, the, this, that, and the other thing happened in the Fortress Republic era, and the fortress is down, it talks about nothing about an Ilkhan or Clan Wolf invasion of Terra and the current reality that we know with the Inner Sphere uh, was not envisioned by FanPro and uh, WizKids writers. That That is a catalyst to take on things. And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying that uh, FanPro apparently had never intended for uh, the clans to ever take Terra and, and because they actively wrote to that end. And uh, at some point I'm going to review this book too. If nothing else, mostly to cover that point, because I thought it's very interesting when we talk about roads not taken, you know, drops not made. This is an example that that novel, the very ending of that novel, is a great example of that. And I don't know if it, I've never heard of anybody else have a take on it. So anyway, till next time, this is Rick, and hope you guys have a great weekend. It's definitely cold and uh, blustery out there, and I'm not going anywhere today. So you guys have a good one. Going on, my friends. This is Rick, and hey, if you like the channel, just 